Welcome, my name is Harald Sack. And I am Mahsa Wafoi. And this is Knowledge Graphs, lecture number four, ontologies as key to knowledge representation. And in this section of the lecture, we are going to talk about the web ontology language, OWL. OWL is here at the modeling language of the semantic web technology stack, and it's one of the most elaborate, let's say, and expressive knowledge representation languages that we have at hand here. So let's have a look at OWL. OWL, of course, is a description logic, which means it's a semantic fragment of first order logic and it, it exists in different flavors. We have here, you will see that later, OWL E, L, R, L, Q, L, which are simply subsets of the main OWL language that we will be talking about now, which is OWL 2 D, L. So this is description logic. OWL2DL also is a subset of OWL2FULL and what's the relation in that? So you see this here nicely at the, at the, at the left right uh, corner. So we have here for example these flavors EL, RL, QL. They are here as we said a subset of DL and then we can go to OWL4FULL and OWL4FULL is also on the other hand fully compatible with RDFS which is not the case with that one because OWL DL has a few restrictions where not all of RDFS concepts that are there are supported. So therefore then if you combine OWL DL and RDFS and make OWL full of it, you will lose the nice property of being computable anymore. So this then complexity rises by including all RDFS concepts like for example reification which is bad in terms of complexity and thereby we are restricting here our knowledge representation to our two DL based on a specific description logic. Our two DL, as mentioned before, is based on description logic Schroik D. And you can see here what it contains. In our two DL there are class expressions, there are different properties, there are class axioms, the T box, there are property axioms as well, the R box, and there are facts about the um, individuals, which is in the A, A box. We will see more details of each of these properties of owl 2 dl in the following slides, so let's go on. Okay, so when we are using OWL, of course, we have to use a specific namespace. So therefore here you see the definition of the namespace prefix OWL and you see here the space at the W3C organization OWL, the standard that we are using here. The first one was defined in 2002, so already 20 years ago. And there is a turtle syntax for OWL. OWL also exists in other kind of serializations, but of course, since we know turtle, we will stick to the turtle notation. The main constituents or building blocks of OWL are classes, individuals and properties. And you might remember we had already classes, individuals and properties and OWL, but they have certain differences. They are comparable, yes, but not fully. As we have said already that there is a difference between OWL2DL based on description logics and OWL4FULL which is based also on RDFS. There is a difference in computability so therefore also in the classes that are defined as pure OWL2DL classes or as classes that also include and uh, inherit all of the concepts that we had defined in RDFS. So small and subtle differences but for our purposes now, if we talk about that, simply say, yeah, they are comparable. They are almost the same. And there exist two predefined classes in OWL2, like in description logics, and these um, classes in description logics are equivalent to the bottom and the top element. So the OWL um, thing is at the equivalent of um, top element in the description logic. It's a class that contains all individuals and all nothing is an equivalent of the bottom element in description logic, which is the empty class. From this slide onward, you can see the um, equivalencies for the owl classes and owl uh, properties in gray and uh, we will not get into the details of description logic equivalence. Okay, what is a class in OWL and how is this defined? A class in OWL is easily defined by naming it 
and by giving it the um, denot denotation A here, which is equivalent to RDF type. So we can define a class person, which is of type owl class. So it's basically the same like uh, in RDF. So we also said there that an indiv individual is of type RDF class, but now it's only owl class. And this is, um, as mentioned before, in RDF turtle serialization. And how can we define individuals in OWL2? That definition of individuals is also done via the naming of the individual and then uh, the, de the um, um, mentioning of class membership. So Isaac Asimov is of RDF type person, and we already have defined person as a class previously. Individuals in OWL2 can also be defined without class membership. And when they are defined so, they are called named individuals. Professor Harold Zack, for example, can be a named individual. And named individual itself in OWL2 is a separate class that basically holds all individuals that do not belong to any other classes yet. OK, so let's proceed. So next thing, of course, what is missing is properties. And for properties, we have two variants in all. So we distinguish there whether, of course, a subject is connected to an object, which is an entity, which are the so-called object properties, or whether the subject is connected to a literal, which would be then the so-called data type properties. Object properties have classes as range. So for example, I can define author to be an object property. For that, I'm simply using here the word object property. Let's simply switch on the laser pointer, then you can see that better. So author is defined to be an object property. And then, of course, I have to define domain and range for the object properties. And that here would be, for example, for author, I would use RDFS domain book. And for author, I would use RDFS range book. So I can here simply reuse the already existing RDF S keywords because from their semantics no harm is done and I don't have to define something new so therefore I simply reuse it to fix domain and range in this case. And for the data type properties it's exactly the same. We have a new keyword which is called OWL data type property. So I define publication date to be an OWL data type property and I s here then simply fix the domain of say this is a thing. So again, you see here, owl thing. This means everything. So every individual that I have is member of that class. This is uh, the same as the um, top element in the description logic. So it can be anything. And the range then is of data type date. So you, you can simply identify data type properties if you look at the range. And if the range is here something like a, a data type, then of course it's a data type property. OK, now let's put everything together and have a look at this example. So in this example, on the top part, the blue part, you can see the T box. And below that, you can see the assertional knowledge in yellow. In this example, we have two classes, the class book and the class person. Then we have an object property author that has the domain book and the range person. So of course. Every book has an author, which is a person. We have a data type property publication date with domain old thing and range exist date. And that is um, in natural language, meaning that for everything, there is a publication date, which is a date. And in the A box down here, you can see um, an individual, Isaac Asimov, which is a person, and foundation, which is a book. And this book has the object as an object property author, and the author of the book is Isaac Asimov. As a data type property, this book has publication date, and the publication date for this particular book foundation is the 30th of 8th of 1951, which is an XSD date. And it's quite a long time ago, isn't it? It is an old book. Okay. Yeah. 
we can define in OWL2 also class hierarchies and for that we also are going to reuse an already existing keyword that we have from RDFS because also here no additional semantics is introduced that might harm OWL2 so therefore we could simply reuse it. Let's look at our example here we have defined poet to be a class and it's a subclass of writer and writer is also a class which is a subclass of person and person we know it's also a class. Interestingly, of course, then of course we can use inferencing and if we know, you know, it can be, uh, if we have this definition, it can be simply entailed that poet also is a subclass of person. Simply we have these two subclass relationships here. So that's quite easy to find out. In addition to our class hierarchies, what I can do now in OWL2 and we're not able to do in RDFS is I can define classes also to be disjunctive. So this is quite handy. So let's see what I do here. I define again book as a class. I have person as a class and of course novel is a subclass of book and author is a subclass of person. And now I can define that book is disjoint with person. So book and persons cannot be or do not overlap these two classes. Interestingly, again, since I have these subclass relationships here already, via inference, it can be entailed that also novel and author, since they are subclasses here of book and person, both they are also disjoint classes. Okay, and there is more that can be defined via the properties that all two provides. We know that, for example, author is a class and writer is a class. And poet is also a class which is a subclass of writer. We also know that author is an equivalent class of writer. And with this set of rules, we can infer that poet is also an author. This equivalence can be helpful in certain situations when we want to infer rules. Okay, let's continue. So let's have a look at individuals and distinctiveness. As you might remember from the open world assumption, of course we have to denote whether two things are really identical in the semantic web. So therefore we have to denote or have to have means to denote the identity and distinctiveness of individuals. Okay, let's have a look at the following example. We have here Foundation, it's declared to be a novel and we have the author of Foundation is Isaac Asimov, the publishing date we have also given here and we say this is the same as a R X one O one two three four five. So, what we do here is we say simply exactly that um, foundation is identical to this thing, and this is only another identifier for the same thing. So, for our same as we denote identity. And then, if we define novel as a class and say this is a subclass of book, and book of course is also a class, we can via inference easily find out that it can be entailed that ARX012345 is also a book because it's exactly the same like foundation and we knew that already before. Vice versa, we can also state the difference of individuals with the keyword OWL different from. I could now denote for example again ARX012345 a novel and, and I say this is different from ARX012346, so another identifier. And then I can simply state, yeah, these two are really different from each other. They are not identical. And these two, that one and that one, they are really identical and not different from each other. So that's important for the open world assumption if we then really want to find out, for example, contradictions against these statements that we have here. Okay, and that closes already the very first lecture of OWL. In the next lecture you will see we will go from simple to complex and we will scale up with OWL.